Hello, hello. Okay. It's working. So we're good to go. We live. Okay, so welcome everyone. We're going to start more or less on time just because we have a lot to get through today. And I'm just going to do a, a couple of slides of intro. So there's a ton of people to thank. Um, or should always start with the, the elders in our community. Um, kind of have an elder, elder here on my left, and we had some of them yesterday, Norma at the back there, um, Bob, who I think is on his way here, Bob Cisco, who was speaking yesterday. Um, so we, uh, and we, we thank Howard as well, who's, who's not with us. Um, so yeah, we always have to give thanks to the, the people that started this movement and community in, in, in the West. Um, and thanks for all the people that helped us organize this. Um, couldn't have really done it without Alvaro. Sarita here helped. Claire, who's on her way, helped. So um, anyway, there's a ton of people who helped us. Um, Sebastiano, who's doing the live streaming, has been working his ass off in the last few days just to set it all up. Um, for those new to the Ibercane scene and community in, in Europe and America, we had a conference last year, which I co-organized in Vienna, which went pretty well. If you didn't know about that, you can go to iboga.info and find out all the presentations, and there's a YouTube channel. Um, and then before that, the last Gita conference was in Mexico, in Tepoztlan. Um, Gita, if you don't know, is the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance. Um, and there's been a sequence of Gita conferences in Durban, Vancouver, Barcelona, and Sayulita before that. Gita at the moment is in suspended animation, um, and hopefully will get reactivated um, very soon. So this is not a Gita conference, 
but next conferences hopefully will be back being Gita organized conferences. Um, could spend quite a lot of time talking about the role of Gita and ICS and maps. Who, who doesn't know about Gita and ICS? Does everybody know? Everybody, you, who doesn't know? Okay, thank you. It's good to know who doesn't know. So Gita is, the, as I said, the Global Ibogaine Therapy Alliance, which was set up by Howard Lotsoff and people around him, such as Boaz um, and Dana. Um, and Gita's role is very much to advocate for um, good practices in Ibogaine provision, um, to advocate for medicalization, um, and also to advocate for sustainable supply of iboga, which we'll be talking about a bit later today. ICS, uh, can everyone remember what ICS stands for? The International, there you go. Thank you, yeah, it's quite difficult to remember that. Anyway, ICS is also a key player, um, non-profit player in the Ibogaine community. Um, We'll hear about some of ICEA's work today and tomorrow, um, various research in Spain and elsewhere. But ICEA's, it's easy to find their website, ICEA's.org. Um, ICEA's has got a dual focus on ayahuasca and ibogaine. Um, and MAPS, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, got that right? Um, MAPS is also another key player in the ibogaine movement. MAPS has... Um, orchestrated various Ibogaine research ob observational studies in the last few years. And who knows, MAPS may play a stronger role in Ibogaine advocacy in the future. Okay. So there's some changes to the schedule in the booklet that you've got. Um, we've shifted things around. So we have a remote presentation from a chap called Yan Guignon at 4.15. He's going to be talking about Iboga sustainability. Um, that means that uh, Claire and Jose Carlos um, will join Rafael right at the end on Saturday evening. So it'll be a panel on Ibogaine research now um, on Saturday evening. Um, and then 11 till 1, we've grouped people into a panel on adjunct therapies. So there'll be Annie Ortiz, who's um, going to be joining us remotely. Mark, it's great that Mark Winkle is here. Um, so we're going to have like a, a panel on ad adjunct therapy, psilocybin, 5-MeO, and how they can be combined with Ibogaine. So we're in this room today and tomorrow, Galileo, or Galileo, um, Galileo. And then we're in Saturday and Sunday, and we're in Rabello, which is just over there. Um, but we'll be put the posters outside the room so you can find it. It's a slightly smaller room. Live streaming, um, <coughs> our channel got blocked yesterday that we'd set up for the conference because we played too many archival clips. Um, so we're going to have to use my personal YouTube channel. Um, I will put it on Facebook in a minute when, once I've stopped sp speaking. But basically, if you put my, my name, Jeremy Wheat, into YouTube, you can find the channel very quickly and we'll be live streaming it on there. But I'll also post it on the... Uh, European Ibogaine Facebook group, and also Ibe the two Ibogaine universes, so people will be able to find it quite easily. Um, people don't seem to tweet these days, but if you are tweeting, there's Ibogaine Forum hashtag, um, and everything that we is recorded will be uploaded to the Gita YouTube channel. Uh, you if you don't know, lunch is available here. It's quite expensive. It's 18 euros. Um, and it's the same in the evening. Um, but I, I guess in the evening, people will want to go into Porto in case you want to stay here. Uh, Doug Green, can't see him, but anyway. Okay. Hey, Doug. Doug set up a really good uh, conference food map, which is on the European Ibogaine f uh, Forum Facebook page, um, the link there. If you want to go to a mall, there's one five minutes away called Norte Shopping. Uber is the same as uh, taxes in terms of price, more or less, and the city center is 25 minutes away. Um, now, anybody that w we're thinking about, everyone, anyone that wants to come, we can all go to dinner and hang out on Saturday. 
And the place that everyone seems to recommend is called Maus Habitos. I don't know how you pronounce it. <laughs> is that pronounced right? Maus Habitos. Um, but if you want to go, can you just let Mafalda outside know that you want to go out on, go to dinner on Saturday so we have a sense of numbers because we have to book the place. Um, I think that's it. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. In the mornings from 9 a.m., we're going to pl be playing some never been seen before archive, recently digitized archival films. So from 9 a.m. tomorrow, we'll be showing the Ibogaine story, which um, Dana wrote the book. And there's a film associated with the book, which, has, which is just was just existing on tapes, but we had it digitized recently. So we'll show that at 9 tomorrow. Um, and then on Saturday, we'll show the 1993 ABC News report, which Norma had a copy of. I think we got from you, or we may have got from... No, I've, we've got it digitized. So we'll show that at 9 a.m. And then this evening, we're going to show I Began Rite of Passage, um, Ben Delonan's film. That's available on YouTube, but it's like a crappy low-res version on YouTube. We're going to show the high-res version, so it'll be much easier to watch. Phones on silent, batteries set aside. That's it. All right, so now I'm going to hand over to Boaz. Let me, has anyone got a booklet? I want to introduce him. Can I borrow a booklet? I think I've got your bio here, Boaz. So, Boaz Wachtel was an Ibogaine treatment provider from 1989 to 2009 in Holland, Panama, and Israel. He has authored numerous articles, both in the popular press and scientific journals, including being the co-author of the first Ibogaine treatment man manual with Howard Lotsoff. Wachtel was the founder of the Green Leaf Party in Israel. He was a nominated member of the Israeli Parliament's Drug Committee examining the legal status of cannabis. And he's also the founder and chief executive Chief Executive Chairman of Cresco Pharma, an Australian publicly traded CBD-based nutraceutical company. Over to you, Boaz. Thank you. <coughs> I'm not too good in... Uh, uh, do you, excuse me. Do you, uh, maybe you want to move here so you can see the... Uh, we've got to move it a little bit uh, this way. Is this okay with everyone? Because the most of the crowd is here. Maya, ah, how's it going? <laughs> so uh, thank you, Jeremy, for the good work and uh, continued support of uh, the movement. It's much appreciated. The uh, movement needs uh, people with uh, organizational skills and uh, passion and uh, compassion. Um, so as Jeremy, as Jeremy said, As Jeremy said, uh, my name is uh, Boaz Wachtel, uh, and I've been working with uh, Howard and Norma and uh, Cisco and Dana uh, from the early days of the Ibogaine movement when it uh I was living in Washington, D.C. one day, and then uh, <coughs> Cisco arrived on his way to the Gabonese embassy to get a visa to get Ibogaine out of, <coughs> out of Gabon. And he was talking about this uh, African shrub he's going to take for uh, his uh, problem at the time. And I thought the guy is uh, really, uh, you know, off the wall. Uh, and then I saw him after the treatment, after Howard treated him. And I saw the guy was really on the wall. I mean, like, uh, <coughs> he made the complete transformation with Ibogaine. And uh, <coughs> he became, uh, uh, he de detoxed from a number of things, never mind. And he became, uh, it's a negative side effect, uh, ultra-religious, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I'm secular, so... Uh <laughs> So one thing to be aware of that could uh, this uh, enhanced spirituality could lead you into uh, you know uh, what <laughs> to extreme uh, religion uh, not extreme is uh, is uh, is beloved and uh, huh? orthodox. orthodox yes orthodox that's the right word so of course we're. Uh, 
uh, the, uh, what's missing here is especially is Howard, that uh, you know uh, he's with us uh, in our hearts and uh, in our minds very often. Uh, he started the whole mess, and uh, he was so uh, gentle and uh, generous and compassionate, and uh <coughs> he's a mentor of a lot of people, Howard and Omar. And uh, without him uh, and uh, Cisco, uh, the movement would not be here today. There were many sacrifices along the way. Uh, people who, uh, uh, in the, in New York, in the early, in the late '80s, <coughs> early '90s, I'm talking about uh, the group being in uh, basically in poverty. All of us uh, working in uh, dungeon uh, places but believing in the cause of Ibergoin, uh, we saw the transformational power of uh, this uh, miraculous uh, plant. <coughs> and slowly, slowly, uh, um, you know, when you have a claim, when you have a claim that you can cure drug addiction, uh, that's a very powerful claim. You know, most people, uh, you know, a big, big pharma is working to cure drug addiction. And here you guys, the Lower East Side, you know, uh, saying that you have found a, a cure for drug addiction. So there was huge skepticism all around us. And, and the fact that it's, uh, you know, it's a holy shrub uh, in the center of a, a community, uh, uh, of a culture in Africa, it was another, you know, crazy story. I mean, for the American media. Uh, and so you want to bring it over here and treat the addicts, and it's also psychedelic. And God, I mean, people get high on it. I mean, uh, I mean, we're going against drugs, and here you're giving someone, and he's tripping for 36 hours. I mean, how are we going to do this, you know? And beyond everything else, it's a scheduled drug, you know? In America, a scheduled drug, I mean, I mean you, it means you're dead in the water. I mean, uh, on the federal level, the, uh, you know, cannabis is basically dead in the water, you know? I mean, it, uh, they, didn't ma they didn't let it move uh, the, to do any research in the, in the United States. All the research on cannabis basically is done outside of the United States because of the federal prohibition. The fact that certain states legalized cannabis in the United States and they decriminalized it and medicalized it is a miracle. I mean, it's uh, the federal prohibition is imploding uh, from within. And for us, international activist community, to see what happened in the United States, you know, that the states went against the federal uh, uh, prohibition and actually won, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, eroding the uh, American-led uh, an exported prohibition, the American cannabis prohibition that was exported through you and drug huh? Juggernaut. The American led juggernauts. Juggernauts. All right, juggernauts. <laughs> What's <laughs> I missed that part yesterday. Uh, it's a thing from India. Ah, from India. So uh, to see that this uh, prohibition of cannabis, and it relates to, uh, to Ibogaine because of both the scheduled drugs and... Uh, to do research with scheduled drugs, especially in the United States. How many of other people here are from the United States? I wonder. One, two, three, four, five. So it's about half the crowd almost, uh, you know, like 40% of the crowd. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to do research. Um, and to pass the FDA, you know, that was a goal. The FDA was like, you know, I mean, there's God and then there's the FDA. On top of uh, of the uh, of God, and uh, we didn't know actually how to go about it. I mean, uh, I figured, you know, I mean, we we had good intentions, there were good uh, good people in the movement, and uh, it was very complex. So first, Howard tried to go for a not for profit. He said, "Wow, I found a, a you know a drug addiction interrupter. Uh, I'll uh, register it as an NGO and." Uh, the Nora uh, Weiner Foundation, that's his uh, mother's name. Uh, his mother was a Holocaust survivor. So, uh, and, uh, and then he tried to uh, collect some money to, uh, as an NGO. And uh, it didn't last, uh, it didn't work very well, you know, uh, as an NGO. It turns out that people are not interested in drug addicts or cure for drug addicts. And uh, it's not a very popular, you know, uh, <coughs> donation destination. Uh, so, and then they uh, registered NDA International, New Drug Application International. Uh, what year was this, Norma? Uh, maybe. 86. Uh, so as a corporation, 
and with some shares. So people who donated or bought some shares in the company and uh, the uh, money that was initially invested by family and friends and some people uh, went to uh, register patents. Howard uh, was a great believer in uh, intellectual property. So uh, he went and filed uh, a number of like five, five patents uh, with ibogaine for the use of uh, opiates, for the use of uh, stimulants, uh, for alcohol, for nicotine, and for poly addiction. I got it right? Yes. Okay. So uh, as it turned out, the patents were maybe too early to register a patent. Patents has a, you know, a lifespan of uh, 20 years. Uh, sometimes you can extend it three more years, I think, in the pharma business because the development cycle is very long. And uh, the question is, how do we develop this uh, uh, plant, this holy plant, this teacher plant, into a medication? How do you give it to people? Uh, how do you go about it? I mean, it's uh, there, are, there aren't many uh, examples or precedents uh, for such a uh, development. I mean, there's herbal medicine, yes? Herbal medicine that is used around the world, traditionally and so forth, the, you, you don't, you, as, as a food supplement. Uh, you, can't, you, you don't need the FDA to, uh, uh, to register a food supplement. Uh, but if you want to treat it as a medicine, and we said it's a medicine, then it has to go the, uh, the long way. So... Uh, Clinical trials, for those who are not so familiar with the issue of clinical trials, is a, it's a long and nasty and expensive road that can either lead you to a blockbuster or to a bust. I mean, the companies are spending $50 million, $100 million into the development of some uh, molecule, and, uh, and they end up with, uh, you know, either it was too toxic or it's uh, unsafe in another way or uh, it's not effective and, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> so clinical trials is the end goal of this movement as we see it right now. It's never been achieved. It's been attempted a number of times. Uh, we, there are uh, 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 clinical protocols in place. Some of them have passed ministries of health, like uh, the one in Israel for a 12 patient detox from opiates to show the efficacy of ibogaine in the elimination of withdrawal symptoms from opiates. It's been approved by the Ministry of Health. It went through the IRB, the Institutional Review Board, and, the, uh, and so forth. But then there was no money to uh, pull it through. There's a, uh, a, a protocol now approved in Spain, in, uh, right? In, uh, yes, there's a protocol where it has been addressed in Spain. It hasn't gone. And I know there's, a, there's attempts in, uh, in Spain also uh, by a Spanish group to... Yes, and they submitted the uh, application already? They got an approval. All right. <clears throat> so you have to make it large enough to make it statistically significant to uh, show results. And then with ibogaine, uh, you cannot have a placebo. It's another issue. Where is Cisco? He's on his way. How do you do with, uh, with placebo? I mean, you, give, you, you go to a trial with people who are addicted to opiates, and if you give them placebo, they go into withdrawal in, uh, in, uh, in a short while. So there are many issues to, to resolve uh, beside the money. It has to be done professionally. It has to be done in a country that have a clinical uh, uh, trial, uh, you know, organizations and an industry that, that you will not have to repeat the clinical trial elsewhere. Yes, we can do it in, in some countries that are you know, very lenient on, on drug stand, uh, treat, uh, drug uh, uh, clinical uh, development uh, protocols. But then when you submit it in Europe or when you submit it in the United States, they'll tell you, oh no, it's not so good. You have to do, redo this one and you have to do this one. So the effort has to be to conduct the clinical, clinical trials in a country that if you do it in this partic particular country, then you can submit it to all the other countries as, a, as it was done in their territory. It's called, they've done harmonization of the clinical standards between the United States, between Europe and Japan. So now if you do clinical trial in one country, it applies also the results could, uh, uh, could be uh, uh, used elsewhere, okay? So uh, I'll, 
and Howard, uh, you know, I was talking to Claire last night, and the la last time uh, we spent uh, time with Howard was in Sosalita, and we sat on the bed, and uh, Claire asked uh, Howard, uh, Howard, what do you uh, want? Uh, you know, uh, what's your wish? So uh, <coughs> Howard said, uh, I, want, uh, I want this to uh, go through clinical trials one day. That was his, uh, his wish, you know? And uh, unfortunately, he died a few months later, but uh <coughs> so our, the movement has to align behind Howard's wish because he's the founder, he's the uh, <coughs> creator, and this is what, uh, that's the mission that we have to do. So uh, I had a, you know, n I never had a con conventional life, but uh, when I came across Howard and Cisco and Norma and Dana, I just uh, finished working in the Israeli embassy in the military section for four years. And as I said, I met uh, Cisco, and he was telling me about this uh, Ibogaine, and uh, I saw him pre and post, and I've never seen uh, <laughs> someone transformed so quickly, you know, in, uh, to, uh, in such a way. I was overwhelmed. And I started uh, listening to uh, Howard, to Cisco, and then I met Howard and Norma and uh, a lot of people. And the more I, uh, uh, I learned about it, I mean, it sounded, wow, it's so interesting, you know. And all my, uh, the, uh, the normal life that I was living, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in New York, I moved to New York was like, but everything else was boring compared to uh, working uh, uh, on Ibogaine. And uh, we started uh, initially Cisco and uh, going to, uh, going to uh, the Netherlands to do some treatments in uh, Amsterdam and then uh, in Rotterdam and then Howard and uh, uh, Join and me and uh, Norma and everybody and we used to go back and forth uh, between New York and the Netherlands, uh, usually Pakistani airlines, um, <laughs> because you can fly back and forth from New York to Amsterdam for two, uh, $400, yes? If you don't mind the, uh, the goat smell in the plane. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and we worked, we worked with the Dutch uh, uh, pioneers like uh, uh, Jan Bastians and the guy from uh, uh, Nico, Nico Adrias. These, these were the equivalent of what Cisco did in the United States. Cisco established ICASH. ICASH stands for International Coalition for Addicts Self-Help. Okay? And, uh, and there were, uh, that was the initial days of the harm reduction movement and there were Dutch pioneers who did the same in the Netherlands. We hooked up with them. And then there were some treatments done in the uh, squatters in, uh, in, uh, in Amsterdam, and then, uh, and then in Rotterdam. Uh, there, was, uh, there was in the midst of the, uh, also of the AIDS epidemic. People were dying from AIDS and drugs, uh, you know, uh, all around us. And that was, by the way, the first time in the uh, uh, late 80s I saw the effects of medical cannabis on people uh, with HIV. Yes, and that later translated uh, to a, a, a campaign and the uh, advocacy work on cannabis medicalization uh, in Israel and other parts. And once uh, it was introduced to the Netherlands, especially in Rotterdam, uh, Cisco left some uh, the samples to some people uh, and they used it and they said, wow. You know, I mean, the addicts, uh, the uh, drug users in uh, Rotterdam said, wow, what's this? You know, Nico, he gave it to some people and it's caught like a wildfire, you know. When we talked yesterday about the Ibogaine being a phenomena, a phenomena from uh, bottom up, uh, that, that was uh, when, it, uh, when it emerged. Sorry, I have, I have to shut this monster uh, phone. Uh, okay. Uh, So it went like wildfire uh, in Rotterdam. And uh, at that time, I'm talking about the late 80s, uh, Howard uh, met this uh, researcher, uh, Jolich, his name was Jolich from Erasmus University, and he gave him some, uh, uh, a small dose of ibogaine. He says, why don't you run it on a couple of uh, uh, mice, mices? 
and see what's the effect on uh, morphine uh, addiction. And uh, so he got the uh, rats addicted to, uh, to morphine. And uh, then they gave him ibogaine. And uh, with, uh, with, uh, with rats, you, can, uh, <laughs> you don't do placebo, you do control. <laughs> you know, you don't give them anything, of course. And lo and behold, what we saw uh, 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 on the human uh, level, we saw in the animals, of course. You know, that it uh, eliminate or diminished uh, withdrawal symptoms among uh, 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 rats addicted to opiates. And this guy, Jolich, was actually the first to, uh, one uh, the more in the modern era who started doing the research. Today, there are, if you go into PubMed line, PubMed line, the public uh, uh, medical line uh, online in America, and you type ibogaine, uh, you know, you see hundreds of studies on ibogaine. It's really a well-researched now uh, compound. Yes, it's not. It's not. It has not been like this. Uh, better when research than the other psychedelics. Better, more research than the other psychedelics. It wasn't like this when we started. So, um, so science. When science backs your your claims, your anecdotal claims, you 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 start you're starting to make progress. And then it went to G uh, Glick, another researcher in upstate New York. And the compound started to travel to uh, other researchers in Europe and so forth. And more and more scientific data, especially it's called preclinical data on animals, was collected, yes? <coughs> and in parallel, we did more and more treatments, uh, most of them in the Netherlands. And uh, uh, Cisco was good at it. Uh, he wrote case studies, OK? Okay, this guy was addicted to this, and uh, he came here, and uh, that was his uh, daily dose, and he spent such and such on the drugs every day, and he, uh, we took him to Holland, and we took uh, such and such dose, and uh, it took him, uh, these were his symptoms, and so forth. So, and it piled, and it, uh, it added up, slowly, slowly. And uh, other uh, results came from the Netherlands also, when they did the uh, self-treatment among uh, the community. Uh, there. And then there were a wall of skeptics all around us, all the time. Until today, the movement is surrounded by all these Republicans, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, uh, people, you know, who think that uh, some Democrats too, my uh, Dana says, <coughs> that people think that the, there's enough pharmaceutical solutions for, to treat drug addicts, and besides, the pharmaceutical industry has provided humanity with all the pharmaceutical solutions to any given problem, which is, of course, a huge pile of crap, okay? <laughs> There's so many bad medicines out there that have gone through the FDA, yes, and they're doing tremendous damage to people. They get them addicted. They have severe uh, 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 side effects. And no one is studying drug-to-drug uh, -drug interaction, yes? And, and the, the worst part of the pharmaceutical uh, industry is that they run the tests or the clinical development usually on young males, yes, and not on uh, women. And they run it on young men because they're young and strong, so, I mean, nothing is going to happen to them compared to old uh, or men or, or women. And women have usually reproductive issues that they don't want to deal with. Uh, so when they are done with checking the... Uh, uh, the drug on, on men, then they say, okay, it also works for women, you know? Women can take it also, but because women's metabolize, uh, uh, metabolism and biology is we're different creatures, you know, we live on the same earth, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> uh, for example, with ibogaine, we've learned throughout the years that women, especially the uh, frail ones uh, who are thin, and uh, should take half the dose than men take, yes? Uh, you know, even for the same body weight. That's what we, uh, uh, that's the ultimate conclusion, huh, Claire? You're early. <laughs> so, and here we have a shrub or a plant that it has been given in its natural form. Yes, in an African society, an African uh, in the Buiti, among the uh, Buiti tribe, 
for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So there's a pharmaceutical knowledge in this act. Usually societies do not embrace plant teachers, yes, or, or uh, they don't make plants holy unless this plant is good for their societies, okay? And you see it in, in the case of the ayahuasca. Uh, in ayahuasca, in communities, in urban communities now in Brazil that use ayahuasca, they have less drug use and drug abuse uh, than, uh, than in communities they don't use ayahuasca. And all psychedelics, actually, uh, we don't like to call ibogaine a psychedelic drug. It's actually ramogenic. You know what's a ramogenic drug? There's the REM sleep, yes, and the brain waves, you know, are similar to the brain waves under the ibogaine uh, treatment. So it's a ramogenic drug. It releases suppressed memories in a visualized form. It unleashes the visual element of our DNA, our genetics, okay? We have a, ge we have a visual component in our genes, and ibogaine is the only uh, drug, I think, that does that uh, better than anybody else. There are some other psychedelics that you unleash that visual memory that we have of ourselves and our ancestors, but ibogaine does it better than any, anyone else. And then there was, in the, in the 60s also, LSD was thought as a cure for alcoholism. <clears throat> yes, that was the initial some uh, people took. So there's a common anti-mechanism, anti-addiction mechanism among psychedelic drugs that could be found, that exists, that works to a certain degree, degree but ibogaine is the most powerful of them all. Yes? We had a guy in the film that the uh, ABC News who came to check us uh, day one, this movie. He came and uh, says, oh, these guys, they... Uh, snake oil uh, salesman from the Lower East Side saying they have a cure for, you know, drug addiction. So uh, they, um, they checked, uh, you know, three people that uh, we treated, yes. One was on methadone, one was uh, on uh, cocaine, and the third one was heroin. And they followed us through. Uh, before, you know, they, uh, they uh, followed them in New York in their uh, daily lives and, their, and so forth, and then uh, also uh, followed uh, to the Netherlands. And they did very well, these guys, okay? These three guys, after the treatment. They were able to detox, and, and they had a good period, as we see, of about six months where they were really doing great, okay? So we now know, yes, because of the work of some other scientists, uh, some, uh, some scientists, that ibogaine has a very powerful antidepressant, uh, antidepressant uh, uh, metabolite that lasts in the, uh, has a slow release, yes, in the, in the body. And usually drugs are covering uh, very uh, severe issues of traumas and depression and so forth. And when you take, the, you remove the drugs away from someone's lives, then some of them, uh, you know, float to the top. And this metabolite that lasts, you can say, for six months for everybody, for uh, a period of time, is the time, the constructive time post abogan treatment that allows people to reorganize them, their lives and uh, get their act together again, if they can change the environment they live in, get a, erase their drug dealers from the phone, which is a very difficult thing, uh, and so forth, then they can. So my, from my perspective, which is a perspective of almost 35 years in the movement, uh, there's a room for uh, multiple treatments, okay? We initially thought that one time, one time shot was, this is all it takes, but uh, uh, you can see significant improvements of people who are highly motivated and one time is not enough for them so they come back a few months later and they do a second uh, they do a second uh, a second round or sometimes a third round or sometimes a fourth round until they are free from the animal on their backs it takes a lot of motivation and it takes a lot of uh, self-exploration 
And Ibogaine is a wonderful tool to get to really to the bottom of the issues that uh, uh, of the dynamics that dictate the reason why people are uh, have become addicts. It allows you to view yourself as you were before you were an addict. And that's a very important thing. And the psychiatrist, and the psychiatry, a psychiatric uh, uh, world, <coughs> always looked at ibogaine as a competition because the catharsis that ibogaine brings you to actually is a competition for their, for their profession. I mean, they say, the uh, psychiatrist, you come, you lay on my couch for $200 an hour for the next 10 years, three times a week, and I'll get you somewhere at the end of the road, and we do it in three days, yes, for $1,500. So uh, we were not very loved by the psychiatric com uh, community. And when we had psychiatrists in the treatments, and they are very inquisitive people. <laughs> I, d I don't know any normal psychiatrist, by the way, but, uh, <laughs> But all the time they want to they, 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 they get involved in the, in how you're feeling and what you're seeing and this and that. And that, that's anti, uh, uh, in my intuition or in our intuition, is interfering with the very important processes that the individual go through during treatment. You understand? If you want to interview a patient, let him come down. You sit down, they usually they remember for the next 24, 36 hours what, you, what they've seen, and what they've gone through, what they, what's been released and so forth. But during the treatment, you cover their eyes, you give them the earplugs, and you let them go. And everybody will find its own way to where they have to go. And Ibogaine is a great uh, 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 road teacher, yes, to, to the essence of whether you choose life with drugs or whether you choose death, you know, or life with, uh, life, uh, life with drugs, or you choose uh, life without drugs. And uh, philosophically saying is uh, one day we were doing, uh, so we looked for doctors to, to join our treatments. I mean, there were four of us, yes, in a blue car, running around in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, in an old Ford, Ford Cortina, uh, cont uh, what is it called, Cortina? Cortina. Cortina. <laughs> And we were looking for doctors to help us. I mean, Howard was a filmmaker, and so is Norma, and Cisco was a, uh, is a paralegal, yes? And, uh, and Dana was an activist. I never know how to define you, uh, Dana. Journalist. journalist. Okay, journalist, sorry, Dana. <coughs> All right. Yeah. He's an activist journalist. So, uh, the first one, the first doctor that Howard persuaded to join, to even observe the treatments, was Professor Jan Bastians. Uh, God bless his soul. Professor Jan Bastians was a Dutch psychiatrist. Actually, one of the few people during the Second World War that uh, belonged to the Dutch resistance against the Nazis. Yes? And just for that, he got an award from the uh, Dutch Queen from the uh, Dutch Queen. And he came to us, and we worked with, uh, with a woman by the name of Hertha uh, in Rotterdam to uh, sit with us, the, uh, the psychiatrist. And after the treatment, they used to go, we used to take them to Leiden. We had a clinic, he had two clinics, one in Leiden and one uh, near the German uh, Dutch border. He was in his uh, late 70s by then, right, Norma? He was a, a huge man with a great soul, and he treated, he was such a pioneer, this guy, he treated Holocaust survivors in the 50s with LSD, okay? When no one else thought about alleviating PTSD from Holocaust, this guy was treating people with, with, with LSD in the 50s. Imagine how far ahead he was uh, of everybody's curve. I mean, now we know that psychedelics, uh, whether it's MD, uh, you know, uh, LSD or psilocybin or what have you, are very good to deal with the PTSD. He's the, this, this is the doctor who, who've done it. And, uh, and Dr. Bast Jan Bastians, uh, Professor Jan Bastians, uh, he, was, uh, he helped us to introduce uh, the ibogaine into other uh, doctors and other uh, individuals in the Netherlands. 
And uh, at the same time, there was a process vis-a-vis -vis NIDA, NIDA that we all love to hate, you know, the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Uh, but actually, they funded animal studies in the value of $5 million they put in there, Cisco. $8 million. So the spark was on, and NIDA uh, said, OK, we're going to do this, but only on animals. Yes, and they spent considerable money. For a federal point of view, it's like nothing, yes. And they came up with some very interesting results uh, on ibogaine uh, with animal uh, research. So that helped propel it even further. And in parallel, uh, we tried to meet people with the FDA. We went to Rockville in Maryland, Norma and uh, me and Cisco and uh, everybody and uh, we try to see what is this FDA thing, you know, how to, uh, how to deal with it. We figured we don't have the money, so we went to Wall Street. We say uh, the pharmaceutical companies, listen, we have here uh, something, you know, I mean, uh, you know, can save the fucking half the world, you know, I mean, uh, people from drugs, you can get them off drugs. I mean, uh, do you see what we see here? Uh, and, uh, you know, we need some money to, uh, to do this, to do run clinical trials and this. So the pharma people said, uh, uh, how many times uh, you take it a day? Uh, well, you don't take it how many times a day. You take it like once or twice in your lifetime. So, oh, sorry, we don't work in such a model. If you don't take, uh, you know, a few times a day or like a couple times a week, you know, thank you, like methadone or something like this, uh, it doesn't make sense. And besides, you know, I mean, this population you're dealing with, they are not very nice people, you know? <laughs> We may have some uh, insurance issues here. You know, thank you very much. You know, you're on your own. Okay? Yeah. Five minutes. All right. Photos. 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 Where's the photo? The photo. Just press here. Okay. <laughs> so, um, and here we are fast forwarding uh, to 20... Uh, 20, uh, okay, I'll just, give me uh, 10 minutes. All right, uh, Jeremy. Here's Howard. Take that one. Okay. So that's, uh, that's in a Marconi Cafe. It was a, uh, a squatter. That's where we uh, worked with, uh, they introduced us to a lot of uh, good people in, uh, in, uh, in Holland. Uh, this is Howard. Uh, Norma and Chris uh, Schwartz. Uh, we used to move from one hotel to another, or from one squatter to another, from sleeping on the floor. Who sat on the floor? You sat on the floor. You slept on the floor. We slept on the floor, you know. When we were, huh? <laughs> we slept on the floor also, you know, for many, uh, many days. It's not so bad for the back. Uh, <laughs> Great folks uh, all over, uh, creative people, the most complex and interesting people, you know, I mean, uh, oh, have many times, <laughs> many times have, uh, you know, emotional problems. The simple people, you know, I mean, you know, the accountants and so forth, they don't have a lot of problems, <laughs> they don't understand much in life, <laughs> and usually they don't go into trouble too much, <laughs> they don't explore. <laughs> uh, it's uh, me and the uh, uh, with the uh, with the rainout, uh, Howard, uh, and uh, rainout, and his, uh, they helped us with the treatments uh, in the late '80s. Uh, we did uh, Howard did the interviews, and uh, they had an underground. Uh, everything was underground in uh, in Amsterdam at that time. <laughs> to, to to be able to squat there, to have a radio station underground, you know, illegal, you know, it was all very exciting. Uh, Simon Winkenu, uh, a pioneer in, uh, in Dutch uh, uh, cannabis policy, yes, uh, and an author, a famous uh, Dutch author, and his wife. Uh, that's uh, Bob, uh, Cisco, uh, in the Orion Hotel. Orion Hotel is a half-star hotel in, uh, <laughs> in Rotterdam. <laughs> And uh, the first treatment uh, I, w I participated with was a guy who was a drummer. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, Joe, uh, Joe uh, and uh, 10 minutes after he arrived to Rotterdam, he disappeared. <laughs> you know, we just started uh, chasing him on the streets, you know, to try to get him into treatment. So you know the stories. Anybody who's gone through, uh, uh, through uh, treatments. This is Ni Nico, Nico Adrians. Yes. He, he's no longer with us. He was... Uh, Died of HIV AIDS. Uh, he was also uh, distributing uh, heroin uh, uh, in a uh, controlled environment. Uh, one of the first, uh, you know, uh, major harm reduction, harm reductionist. This is Norma. Uh, this is uh, next to Hertha's house. Uh, you see on the left, uh, a very courageous uh, Dutch woman. This is Professor Jan Bastian. Uh, who came to observe the treatments. This is the living quarters. <laughs> I'm sure your room looked better than this living quarters today. <laughs> For weeks at a time. Okay, so uh, we had a model which is not very economically sustainable to treat uh, uh, someone who has got money and to treat someone who doesn't have money, okay? So, uh, and this is the buck. This is the uh, Ibo mobile. And here we go. Uh, this is uh, on the left is uh, Deborah Mash and uh, Sanchez Ramos on the right. They came from the University of Miami. <laughs> <laughs> what, ha what happened? Uh, yeah. Yeah, from the University of Miami. Professor De Deborah Mash. Uh, uh, she, she's a pharmacologist. She has the biggest uh, brain bank in the United States. Ego. And what? And ego. An ego. Yeah. Dead brains and ego. That's a good combination. Uh, and Sanchez Ramos is a neuro uh, uh, neuro guy. Uh, he ran with her the first Ibogaine uh, phase one uh, study in uh, the University of Miami. Do it quickly. So, this is an example of how not to do treatments. Why? Because the screens. You see, we used to have a, a suitcase, and in the suitcase we had two uh, two screens. Yeah, and the screen and the wires went to the other room, and somebody would be with the uh, the, the one that was going through the treatment, and someone would be, and we were sitting here because we had guests to to show them. So you can't bring everybody to the room, you know, of the patient. So, uh, and it's an audio and, uh, and, uh, and visual. And uh, this is Udi Bastian's there, the son, okay. And uh, this is a picture uh, of Nancy, of uh, on Ibogaine, yes. And this is Jodis, the first uh, Dutch uh, scientist from Erasmus University who done the, uh, uh, the morphine and the mice. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work. Also, Norma was the uh, <laughs> organizer. She put us three men, you know, in order all the time. <laughs> Guys, you know, now we do this. Uh, now we <laughs> you know, uh, this is Jan Bastian. Again, this is in his uh, clinic, in his clinic after the treatments. Uh, some people, Howard, this is uh, Bastian's wife. So we used to talk to each other and exchange, uh, you know, information. Howard brought her flowers for her birthday. <laughs> He's such a... And then we went to the uh, to Brussels, to the American Embassy. We went everywhere, you know. Uh, uh, I was the driver uh, of Noma and Howard <laughs> all the time. And, uh, uh, and helping uh, whatever I could. I was the medical authority. I was in my military se uh, service. I was a, a combat medic. I had a training for through combat medic. So in the movement, I was the medical authority for a number of years. You have to understand the situation. Okay. <laughs> Uh, now, you can look at a drug addiction as a, a form of combat, you know. 
but uh, and and uh, treatment. But uh, you know, it was a little scary. I mean, that's a lot of responsibility. There are people who sit here in the room, and who are taking enormous personal responsibilities uh, on their lives and in their families, and it has to be it has to be appreciated. It's a it's a huge burden. It's an emotional burden on the treatment providers. It's a uh, it's draining when you give and give and give and give for years. You are you have to realize that you are drained emotionally. You need sometimes to take breaks. You will do justice to those who are who you treat as well. Take a vacation. You cannot do back to back treatments years. Years in and years out, because you will burn yourself. Okay, I'm coming uh, to a conclusion, uh, Jeremy. We can talk here. Uh, uh, this is the ABC News uh, uh, reviews. Okay. This is Cisco. Uh, that's his uh, first joint in his hand. No, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, we joined the harm reduction movement. Uh, in its infancy, Cisco, uh, Noma, and Howard. There were good times, there were hard times, but we pulled it through. This is the AIDS conference in 1992 in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, this is where, uh, this is the room I took the Ibo in. A uh, Nova Hotel. Just uh, to kill the designer, what? Yes, Nova Hotel. Yes. Yes. Celestial hotels. Celestial hotels. So these are pictures uh, from that period. People who have been treated. Uh, this is uh, uh, Ahad George Bear, Hans George Bear from Germany. This is a great picture of them both. Is on the way to the FDA. Yes, looking, uh, going back and forth to the FDA. It's a great picture, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of wishful thinking was gone, was going on. This is Deborah Mash, speaking at Abergno conference. The movement had a fallout with Deborah Mash, but she did some very important work uh, throughout the years. Uh, is well is Cisco again? So it's it's really a, a, g a very difficult work to promote something against the odds for so many years. You know, I mean, uh, we are fast forward 33, 35 years now, and 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 uh, we talked Norma and I and Cisco. You know, yesterday that we are so uh, overwhelmed to see the movement and the. So many people are doing treatments in so many places. Yes, uh, they are not done 100% uh, in terms of safety. Yes, there are people who are not doing uh, screening as they should. And that's the number one issue. If you want to save lives, if you want to not destroy lives, you have to uh, insist on the screening. Each one of you uh, who is a treatment provider, that's the number one issue. And the ibogaine that started from Howard and Noma, you know, uh, you know, uh, on a crusade, is now almost across the world. I mean, there are people here from South Africa, there are people from Afghanistan who are doing treatment in uh, in Afghanistan, Asia. Malaysia, Canada, Australia, Australia. Uh, who? Where else? New Zealand, New Zealand. Costa Rica, Costa Rica. Uh, Portugal. 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 See, ah, uh, Seneca? Mexico. Mexico, yes, Mexico. So many clinics in Mexico. This is really uh, an amazing. So we never made it through the FDA. You know, as I said yesterday, fuck the FDA. You know, there's life beyond the FDA. We can work in many countries. But the bottom line, and I have to finish here, uh, is that the number one issue in this movement, and it's not being addressed the way it should, is safety. We've written safety protocols. We've established GITA to, uh, uh, to watch over the safety of the patients everywhere. And, you know, it's not just for the patient. 
safety. It's for your own safety. Because if someone, if something happens to someone, it's your ass on fires. You understand? So if someone tells you, listen, my liver is okay. I checked it like two years ago. They say, no, I want you to check it now. Oh, and I did a a AKG, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, three years ago. No, I want you. So you run through the battery of tests. You meet with them. You measure the level of motivation. And only when you're 100% sure that they've passed all the inclusion criterias, there's inclusion and exclusion criterias, you have to study them and know them by heart. Okay? If someone's liver is, is, is beyond a certain point, he's not going to the treatment. If he's got a heart or she's got a heart problem, you're not taking them in. Some people cannot be saved because of their physical situation. It's a very tragic uh, uh, position to be in, to tell someone, I cannot treat you because you're not well. And many of them are not very well. And if you take the risk sometimes, and if someone dies, God forbid, I mean, it's hurting not just this individual and his family and you, it vibrates through the ibogaine world, yes? And even though Ken Alper did a study, very important study, showing that ibogaine was not the, uh, uh, the major cause of death at any of the fatalities that were involved, the bottom line of this study by Ken Alper was that many of these deaths could have been avoided if proper screening would have taken place, yes? These people were sick to begin with, and sometimes, sometimes they die, uh, regardless of whether they take ibogaine or not. So uh, Jeremy is pushing me here, so I mean, there's so much to say, and uh, what can I say? I, uh, I love you all, and I wish we can continue uh, to work this together for uh, as many years as possible. Thank you. Just like to thank Boas for coming because uh, he's actually supposed to be in Vienna at a cannabis conference. So thanks very much. You're, you're leaving soon, right? Uh, no, at uh, 2 o'clock. Ah, okay. So we don't have time for questions because we're a bit over time. And we've got Dana next. Wait, 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 wait. Dana's here all week. So. Can I just maybe make it? Yeah, sure. There, no, if you go ahead. Yeah. There has never been an Ibogaine conference where a shrine or an altar has not been built. We need to, we need to put one together. Okay. With all the people that are here, we've got to have things and, okay. and make, a, make an altar. Okay. How do we do that? Knock, knock, knock. Uh, Dana, hold on, hold on. Let, let me say something. We've never done this without an altar. Have you plugged it in? I don't know how to use this. You haven't plugged it in yet. Oh, you've got it plugged in. Oh, no, no, it's plugged in, yeah, yeah.
Okay. So, um, we're good to start. So we've had a request to build a shrine. And um, Asha Karavali, who's disappeared, she's going to start the shrine off. Um, but also, so everybody, there, there, hold on, hold on. Is, this is now replacing my presentation. I, no, no, no. I'm, I'm so Asha is going to start the shrine off, and everybody is invited to contribute to building the shrine in this room. So she will be building the, there she is. We'll be building a shrine, an altar. Okay. All right, so I'm going to introduce Dana. Dana Beale, yippee heir to William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg, who reinitiated Ibogaine development with Howard Lotsoff in the early 80s, is the principal champion of the Guterell hypothesis, identifying Ibo the Ibogaine mechanism with the neuroplasticity of REM sleep, as opposed to NIDA development reduction to blockade of a single alpha-3 beta-4 nicotinic acetyl acetylcholine react receptor. He chronicles the ACT UP campaign for NIDA to develop it as a treatment for cocaine de dependency from 91 to 95 in the Ibogaine story report on the Staten Island project. In this, Beale first correlated Ibogaine visualizations with the penrose hammeroff hypothesis of a photonic basis of consciousness in microtubules, correctly intuiting that the neuroplastic function neurotrophins play in correcting long-term memory heralding the findings of Ron and et al. of a role for GDNF in the persistence of the Ibogaine effect. After yeah. helping put on the first international Ibogaine conference at NYU in 1999, Beale and Lotsoff organized an annual Ibogaine forum in New York, D.C. or Boston from 20, 2003 to 2010, as well as annual panels at DPA HRC conferences. More recently, he has been a regular presenter at conferences of GITA, predicting correctly that Ibogaine would be effective for Parkinson's disease. In February 